Well, this is going to be an interesting study. I think this is uh, like way at the top of my list because I, uh, I happen to be someone who has struggled with this, with this thing on guilt. Does anybody, any, anybody else struggle with guilt from time to time? Or are you just like somehow exempt? <laughs> <clears throat> and you do notice, do notice how the accuser or the brethren will come in there and say, excuse me, do you remember? And of course, if it's before the Lord and forgiven, it's over, right? Okay, let's get on with this. Uh, let me set it up for you real quick. Uh, I think most of you know, are familiar with this, if not all of you. This is a point in King David's life. He's using David for an example. Uh, it's a great example. Uh, at this point, Bathsheba is pregnant. He has uh, committed adultery with her. He has uh, managed to kill Uriah, her husband. So he's guilty of a lot of things. Uh, manipulation, lying. Uh, there is some speculation that Uriah was probably one of his mighty men. I think he probably was. So very close, very close relationship there and yet had him murdered, okay? And in denial, obviously, with this whole thing and until the prophet confronts him, you're the man. And um, it's just, um, you notice that this is one thing about sin is you, it's never committed in a vacuum, right? I mean, you can imagine what the kind of fallout was uh, it's one thing for us, although it's a bad thing, but you, you picture this, this is the king of Israel. And now he's a disgrace of the entire nation, if not the, the heathen nations around. What must his family think? Uh, it's, it's, it's touched lives of other people, of Uriah, of other, of, uh, other men. So uh, this is something that really needs to be dealt with, and that's why I think this is a, a very good lesson. It deals with that sin and the guilt that's caused by it, and we need to get past those things, okay? So uh, let's start here. Let's read uh, Psalm 51 with this account in God's Word. <clears throat> this is David uh, pouring out his heart to the Lord. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude, I love that, the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me known, you will make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me, and do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach trans transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall, ring, shall sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So you can see that contrition there, just pouring itself out before the Lord. Uh, he's confronted, you know, the, uh, it's reminded always that this is the work of, of, of the Holy Spirit and your conscience that you can't deal with a problem unless you first conf confront the fact that you actually have one. You've got to know that there is a problem. You, you can't fix something that you don't know exists. So let's run through this real quick. Consequences of sin. <clears throat> you will have an immediate awareness of sin. That, of course, we're talking about someone who has the Holy Spirit indwelling, right? <clears throat> because if you don't have that, 
your discernment's just a little lacking. <laughs> I think you'd agree on that. And you can see, and you can see that in verse one and two, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, and wash me from my iniquity. So there is that sense of an uncleanness before the Lord. It's, it's, it's just, you, you see your condition. Uh, you lose your fellowship with God. Do not cast me away from your presence. There cannot be, the God cannot be there in the presence of sin. I think one of the reasons why he wasn't there at the cross, uh, there's, there's no fellowship light with darkness. And Jesus became all of mankind's, can, can you imagine what kind of sin was hanging on that cross? All of mankind's sin forever was laid upon him. The sight outside was, was not nearly as ugly as, as what was going on inside when he became sin. God's mercy nailed him to that cross. You lose your anointing to serve. <clears throat> anointing, think about, <clears throat> God is not going to pour anointing through a dirty vessel. When you look at Psalm 133, and you see that anointing that's poured out on Hedgehop, in this case it's David. But there is that, even for us, there is that anointing that's poured out on headship here. It's not ours, it's an, we're an extension of, of everything pastor does here. You're an extension of your pastor. This is body ministry that takes place. And, and you see that anointing poured out. If, if, if you are out of fellowship with God, you're not under there, you're not under that covering and under that anointing when it flows. You're not under cover, you're not under authority. You're, you're, you're out there somewhere. So that anointing is removed for you to serve the Lord. <clears throat> Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You lose your credibility. Why should I listen to you? Right? Boy, I'll tell you what, you know, it only takes a minute to fall, but it takes forever to get a good name back. You know, you've got a good name. You've got, you got to hang on to that. That is so precious. Your credibility is precious. Your praise dries up. You know, it's kind of... It, it's kind of hard to lift holy hands. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when you, when you lift holy hands to God, you're looking to receive. And if your hands are carrying the weight of that sin and that guilt in your life, it's no wonder you're carrying the weight of this world in those hands. It's no wonder you don't get them in the air, and even if you could, they're full. Holy hands are empty hands waiting to receive from God. So you lose your praise. <laughs> uh, you have bro uh, you're broken before God. Uh, I know as David said, the bones that you have broken. God will, you're his, and, and judgment starts in the house of the Lord. God will deal with you. He will bring you to a place of brokenness. And that's, and that's where you need to be before God when, when, you, when you are in sin. Um, you feel guilty before God. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Well, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot on David right now that he's bringing before the Lord. I'm, I mean, just, just pick some. So, okay. <clears throat> so where did this guilt come from? And all the pastors got down here. Guilt comes uh, from the ministry of the Holy Spirit and from your conscience. Um, and conscience is something that God puts in everybody. And conscience doesn't tell you what's right and wrong it tells you what you've done right and wrong. God's Word tells us what's right and wrong and Holy Spirit, right? We have the leading of the Holy Spirit. Conscience tells you when you've transgressed and you know it, right? <clears throat> but uh, the con it's like he's got down here, uh, the conscience is the built-in power of your mind to pass moral judgment on yourself. See that? You're, that's that conscious judging what you have said and done. The conscience contemplates your actions and makes moral self-evaluation. It is God's monitor of the human soul. It is God's voice in the soul. The conscience is your judge that condemns or vindicates you. Got that? However, and this is important, he really wanted me to stress this. Your conscience can be misinformed or conditioned to regard evil as good, or seared and dulled by repeated sin. You keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, you'll get to a place where that sin doesn't seem nearly so bad. 
you know, and I, I love the example. Hughes is, for example, uh, there can be things ingrained in your culture that after years and years and years it's just perfectly acceptable and you don't see it and recognize it as sin anymore. Your conscience doesn't bring that to remembrance. Well, a good example he had was cannibalism. You know, I don't know if you know it, but that's why the Car Caribbean was named C the Caribbean because when they discovered it, these people were cannibals. Carib is meat. So it becomes the Caribbean, the place of the meat eaters. And they, you know, they had no idea that it was wrong. It, they had just gone so long that it was just, it was just acceptable. I think about that today, I, I think a good example of that would be abortion. It, even some of the less, think about it in, in terms of even, even some of the churches that aren't quite as conservative as we are, a lot of them don't have a problem with abortion, and that's alarming. But it has been, it has gone so long and it's become so part of their culture that it, that it doesn't trip the triggers of that conscience anymore. And they're not hearing the Holy Spirit talking to them about how precious life is. It's, it's, just, it's just one of those things. You've got to be on guard. So, well, well, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you know in your heart? Well, you know, Jeremiah 17.9 says that heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? So if, the Holy, if you're not listening, if, you, if, you're, if your conscience is seared to the Holy Spirit to where you don't even hear Him, what is it that's going to tell you whether you, the things in your heart are, are accurate or not? You can be misinformed and not even know it. That's a very dangerous place to be in. You need to get this. That's why this, this when sin comes, we need to deal with these things right away. You know, um, it's, 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 just, it's just a matter that without the ministry of the Holy Spirit to search your heart, when David's talking about that, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Because we're not, we don't have the capacity to do that. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us with those things and reveals our heart to us. Because a lot of times we just don't know. And so it's a dangerous place to be in. So I would think that, you know, looking at this giant uh, of, of guilt, um, it's, it's essential that, that we get these things taken care of right away so we don't move into that area, you know, quickly as possible. Okay, so how do you deal with the guilt of sin? First thing Pastor has here is accept personal responsibility. Own it. You did it. It's yours. You need to own it. You need to own it. Number two, don't make excuses for it. Have you ever made excuses for sin? Don't make excuses. Don't blame others. Okay? The devil didn't make you do it. You know, if God is going to bless you, chances are... God uses people. If God's going to bless you, chances are he's going to send somebody your way to do that. The devil is the same way. Listen, you're not such a, you're not such a spiritual threat to the devil that he'll drop everything he's doing and come see you personally. He'll send a flunky to do it. He'll send a giant to do it. This is a giant of guilt. Remember with, with King David, he, he sent Goliath. You know, you're seeing the physical, but I want you to see the spiritual on it. There's a giant there that David had to deal with. And this, is a, this, this thing of guilt is a giant that needs to be dealt with. And God, and, and God will send someone to bless you, like a pastor that gives you good instruction. But the devil, your enemy, will send a giant your way called guilt to just cripple you and take you out of contention and, and ruin your testimony and take away your ability to minister and let God flow through you. So we need to deal with these things. So don't blame others for your sin. Uh, do not replace repentance and confession with therapy or counseling. Now that is not to say that therapy or counseling is a bad thing. As a matter of fact, we do a lot of counseling here. Okay. I say, you, if it's necessary, do that in addition to, what, to what's going on here before God. But you, you can't replace genuine contrition, repentance, and confession. It's, it, just isn't, it just doesn't work. There's got to be that broken spirit before God, right? Uh, I would suggest one thing to you, that if, if you're going to consider counseling, please, please, please consider a Christian counselor. 
I've, I've been to a secular counselor and I, it, it was a nightmare. And this was before I was saved. And, the, and I didn't have the ability to comprehend it or understand it until I was saved and, I, and God started teaching me things and, and I started remembering the things that I was told in that, those counseling sessions. And I'm like, well, those are terrible. So if there's a necessity for, for counseling, start here. Start here. We have great people that can sit with you that love you and care about you sincerely. You are family. And we, and we will sit with you and help you get through stuff, okay? Okay, acknowledge the sinfulness of your sin. It's, uh, confession is describing your actions with the same words that God uses. I want to just tell you a quick little story here. We have time. Um, I can say some things to you tonight, intentionally, that you wouldn't like. I can say some things to you that will create distance between us, okay? So I'm not saying the same thing you are. So where there's a difference was what's being said that creates distance. But if we say the same thing, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? If we say the same thing, because there is no difference, there is no distance. And it's the same way with God. If we'll say what God says, because there's no difference, there's no distance, and God comes close. God comes, meets us. God, God will meet us there. Do you understand that? When I was first saved the first year, uh, I was a mess, and God had a lot of stuff to deal with. And fortunately, he's still working on me because there's still a lot to do. But I remember uh, there was so much that had to be addressed because uh, I, I was a walking mess. And I remember, I remember coming into church one morning. We're still in the little white church. It's probably been a year at the most. And uh, I was really struggling. I don't even remember what it was, but I was struggling with some stuff. And Lorna Heffelbauer uh, approached me and said, and I remember she was being concerned about, I looked, didn't look good. Is there something wrong? And I said, well, yes, uh, I've been wrestling with some bad habits that I've held before God. And I, and I can't, I keep taking them to God and he, I, I can't seem to be doing anything. I don't think God doesn't want to help me with them. And she gave me some very good advice, taught me something very early on that was very valuable. She said, well, Fred, the problem is God can't help you with bad habits. Well, that was news to me. Uh, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm sorry, Fred, but God is not in the bad habit business. He's in the sin business. He doesn't help you with bad habits. But if you will get into agreement with God and you will call them if you call them the same thing that God calls them, they are not bad habits, they are sin. And now you're saying the same thing that God's saying, there's an agreement there and God can help you with that now that you've identified it for what it is. Okay, so coming into agreement with God, saying the same thing that God says, there's power in the words that you say, especially when you're in agreement with God. Okay, that will help. Uh, transgression is to re rebel against anything that God says that you should be doing. That's against God's law, that's, that's against the leading of the Holy Spirit, that, that's, that's transgression. Uh, iniquity, uh, twisted or perverted uh, uh, of your nature, uh, we know that that's, that's something we deal with. Uh, sin actually uh, is a word that means missing the mark, and evil, of course, is a vile thing. And address your confessions to God. Um, this, this scripture, sometimes I've heard it raise a little uh, ruckus. He says, when, he, when David said, uh, against you and you only have I sinned. And as you see there, all sin is an offense first and foremost to God. It is sin to other people. You need to deal with that. But, but you don't deal with the people that you sinned against first. First, you need to take care of it before the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, all these things will be added unto you. And that's the ability to make those things right with the people that you've sinned against, right? And God gives us pretty clear instructions on how to deal with that. But he's not saying that this is only sin against God. He's saying this is where, this is where everything begins, right here. You've got to start here. This has to be resolved before this can be resolved. This has to be resolved before, the, before that cross is established, right? So how do you kill the giant of guilt? That's a big one. Uh, you see in verse 1, blot out. In verse 2, wash me. 
cleanse me, purge me with hyssop. We have time, so let me touch on this. Hyssop really speaks uh, of a spiritual cleansing. You recall that it was hyssop that was used uh, with the cleansing of lepers. It was hyssop that was dipped into the blood of the Passover lamb and put on the doorposts, right? It was hyssop that actually wasn't a sponge that put that vinegar uh, at, at Jesus' mouth on the cross. It was hyssop, okay? He didn't need that because he didn't need spiritual cleansing. <laughs> hyssop, it's interesting. When Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, did he build the altar in the valley or the mountain? Exactly. When Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, it was on top of Mount Carmel. So if there's going to be an altar for sacrifice to the Lord, you take it to the high places. Okay? just want you to see this, this picture because you'll love this. I do anyway. I'll just share it with you. Hyssop, they believe, because of the nature that you see here, was an herb that was used for healing. It was medicinal. The interesting thing about hyssop is it only grows in high elevations on the side of the mountain in the cleft of the rock. In the cracks of the rock is where hyssop grows, in the high elevations where the sacrifices are made. Is that, a, is that not a great picture? I love that picture. And that's what we see David asking. He's, this really speaks, this is before Jesus came. This really speaks when he says, to cleanse me with hyssop, he's really talking about a spiritual cleansing that he needs to take place. And it really speaks of the salvation and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's pretty interesting that there's a reference there to that for me. I find it very interesting. Purge me with hyssop. Deliver me from the guilt. Only the blood of Jesus is power enough, powerful enough to remove the guilt of sin. You remember Paul, I can't wait till pastor gets into this with Romans. Paul, when... Uh, when he was, when he was w doing this war with the spirit and the flesh in Romans 7, at the end there, and I think right around 23, 24, he comes to this conclusion. He says, who can deliver me from this body of sin? I thank God in Jesus Christ, right? It's only the, the, through the blood of Jesus Christ that this, that this, this guilt of that sin can be removed. Sin can be, but it's not enough to just remove the sin. Because the sin can be gone and all blotted out. But unless we have some kind, something that's available to us to remove that guilt as well, it'll still torment you. And if you're struggling with that, this is going to be a great lesson for you. If, if there's things there that are still, you know your sins are forgiven, but there's still that torment to, that the enemy is bringing to your remembrance about you, I still feel guilty. We need to look at this, consume it, and bring it before God, and use this for yourself as well, and teach this to these people. We, we all need this. There is, I don't know anybody, honestly. I can't even conceive of someone who, doesn't not, who does not deal with guilt. It's just, it's, just, it's just something we contend with in life. And I think we really need to really use this and, and receive this as God's word and God's truth so that we can deal. Listen, you can't minister to somebody something that God has not ministered to you. If you have an experience, it's very difficult for you to explain or carry that experience and minister that to somebody else. So if, if this is an area for you, then receive it and then take it to those people and just help them. That's what we're here for, right? Okay. Um, return, restore the joy. Make me, listen to David, make me hear joy and gladness. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. A cleansed conscience and a forgiven heart brings joy to the soul. And the joy, we do need strength in this day and age because the joy, it is, the Bible says, God said it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. There needs to be that joy, even in adverse conditions. You can be sad, but there still needs to be that joy of the Lord that possesses you, that carries you through, and gives you strength to see, see those things through. 
all the way down to the end. Renew that fellowship. And there again, when you're in agreement with God and you get these things under the blood, there is that re restoration of fellowship with the Lord. He will, you know, God, God will hide his face. You, can't, you cannot go to God with these things on your heart and they haven't been taken care of. Because every time you go to God, all he wants to talk about is that one thing. Have you ever noticed, anybody ever noticed that? I want to talk to him about something else and God says, uh, not till we take care of this. And he keeps bringing it to your remembrance. We need to deal with this first. Why? Because there needs to be that restoration of fellowship with God so that he can come close and you're in agreement. Does that make sense? Okay. John 3, 20 and 21. Let's see if we can find that real quick. Am I going too fast? Oh, it's First John 3.20 and 21. For if our heart condemns us, there is that. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So there again is that work of the Holy Spirit. You know, and even David, when he says, you know, he not only says, cleanse me and purge me, but then cleanse me with water, type of the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot going on there that David is asking for. And it really takes uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish all that work.